So first of all, uh, well, thank you everyone for being here. I would like to thanks a lot, Suzanne, because this has been the workshop in, but well, we didn't have a lot of uh, workshops and uh, conference those last uh, three years. So it was a little bit difficult. But I think here, like really a small part of people that are really specialists in the field of uh, radio velocity, going to the extreme precision is really what we have to do in the future. Uh, if we want really to make progress, because just one people in one corner will not be able to do the job because there is really several, several tasks uh, that we have to deal with. So we have a discussion now. Uh, so I have a few slides uh, to introduce a little bit, uh, because perhaps I want to, to focus a little bit the, the discussion in two different directions. One is a little bit about the instruments uh, and what we can do to I solve a little bit the issues that we have the instrument because although we have wonderful instrument, there is still some some systematics there. And then the other one, um, I take a little bit on, on stellar activity and what we can do. Okay, so we all know the challenge. Uh, we measure a spectrum on the detector. We want to measure a Doppler shift. And the thing is that the spectrum moves by meters per second or whatever, uh, while uh, a pixel is a few hundreds of meters per second. So this is, of course, a very difficult task. And to do it, basically, to be able to reach to this meter per second that you cannot reach on the spectral line because you don't have the resolution to do it, basically, we use the cross-correlation or template matching or other techniques that are redu uh, reducing the dimension, basically, increasing the signal to noise, and then we are able to measure a very precise uh, velocities that way. So I would say that with this technique, where we, we reduce the dimension of the problem to increase the signal to noise, of course, you lose some information. So there is some good points. Okay, so you improve your SNR, you improve your radio velocity precision. Very good. Uh, but then it's also a technique that is very simple and rather robust, so you can do it for any stars, no problem. It's, you can get a velocity. Uh, quickly, I would say. Uh, and on one side, it's quite good because you mitigate stellar activity or instrumental signals as well. Because if you think about uh, instrumental signals or activity affecting different parts of your spectral lines of, of your spectra, then when you average everything together, you average the signal. So it was good so far or five, ten years ago. But nowadays, basically, we want to extract the signal to be able to model it. So it's perhaps not the best way to mitigate it at this level, because then you mix all the information together, and then it's very difficult to extract uh, what you want to do. So a con of, of this is that you lose uh, some local information that can happen at the spectral level. And then uh, if you are trying to understand the physics of stellar activity or something like that. Uh, you mix the information from different spectral lines from at different depths in the star. So uh, yeah, you mix this, one, this information and then it's really difficult to recover uh, what you want. So to get a physical understanding of stellar activity based on just the radio velocity and a few proxy is, is, is tough. So let's see a little bit on terms uh, at the level of the instrument. So here it's just a raw image. I think this is halves or halves nose, whatever. So you have the different orders, okay? And then we have uh, the reference. Uh, in this case, you can see it's, uh, it's an FP. It could be uh, LSC, it could be Torian lines. Uh, already you see some systematics there, which are those, which are called ghosts. And this is in fact secondary reflection in your instrument. So. The spectrum is uh, image on the detector, then you have a reflection, it goes back to the gratings, come back, and so you have some ghosts. So those are the same spectral orders that you can see. It can be from different orders, and they have an angle uh, because uh, due to the reflect to the to this reflection. Then you also had this reference lamp here to do uh, to be very precise in terms of uh, velocity precision to measure the drift of your instrument. And if so, for the FP, for the laser, it's not so much a problem, but if you have Torian lines, they start to be very uh, saturated, and then they can start to bleed on the detector and start to contaminate uh, your spectrum. 
So this you have uh, to take into account in some cases. Which way do you read out? Uh, along the orders. You read out on the spectral direction. Yeah. Uh, this in is with ELAM, they worry a lot about charge transfer. And yes. So we do it the right way. But indeed, uh, if you don't, yeah, this is something that, that you have, we have to take into account. And for example, on, it depends on the detector. On HARPS, we don't have problem on Expresso either, but on HARPS nodes, we have some charge of inefficiency, which uh, in the end will uh, warp your stellar lines or your whatever, and in fact we correct for the charge that we are losing, because we know very exactly what is the CT of the detector. But this is an effect you have to take into account. Okay. So this is just a small example uh, of contamination due to a ghost. Uh, here you have the main order, so this is in the very blue, it's uh, where there is the calcium line, the H line, okay. And what I did here in green is the extracted uh, spectrum, uh, along the order, the extracted flux along the order, so it's the spectrum of the, of the sun, I think, in this case. And I will also extract it at the level of, of the blue and the orange line. And this is what you can see here in blue and in orange. And of course, when you cross this ghost here, the orange and blue points, you see that there is some flux. And of course, this flux is also contaminating the center of the line. But it's very difficult to know what is the contamination if you only have uh, the green spectrum here. Uh, so, for example, on Harps nodes, we have this problem that we have this ghost really at the center of the H line, and it creates some systematics uh, when we measure the calcium index. Uh, so, this is so this is for the calcium index. But if we have a spectral lines there that will shift due to the barycentric correct, uh, barycentric uh, velocity of the Earth, then it will be affected by that. So, this is something you have to, to take into account. Um, then here, uh, it's another effect that we have on HARPS. It's an uh, effect of stitching, uh, ways uh, you have you do the detectors. Uh, like on HARPS, every uh, 512 pixel, we have a pixel that is a little bit wider or a little bit smaller. And then if you don't include this in your wavelength solution, you will have an effect uh, that can have uh, 40 meters per second peak to peak. So you can correct for this if you know the effect, and this is what Michael is doing uh, with this code Yaraha. And then you are, you are left with really residual that are much better. Um, this is just the effect of Telerix as well. Here you can see uh, Telerix that are affected the spectral line, which is this red line here. And you see also, in this case, hundreds of meters per second of effect. Okay. So the problem uh, with the fact that we lose some information is that all those local effects, when you average out over the entire spectrum with the CCF template matching, Although the effect are 10 to 100 meters per second locally, in the end, it's one or two meters per second. Uh, so it's difficult to correct because in the end, it has a low amplitude. And also, you are mixing the information from, from several spectral lines. Uh, so there is some technique. You can either mask those regions, okay, either physically, and you say, I don't take into account this, this spectrum. Or some people the, some compute the velocity for different chunks. And then you just reject chunks that have too much detail, things like that. Or you can correct at the spectrum level, and this is uh, basically what you can do with a code like Yaha that Michael published. And the advantage of this is that you can still use the information that, that is there. So when you are observing very bright stars, you don't really care, but when you go towards M dwarfs, uh, you start to care. And this is what you can hope to do. You can perhaps even do a little bit better. When you start to correct for all the systematics that you see at the detector level, uh, this is how much you can gain, like 20 to 30 percent in terms of radio velocity precision. So this, those are different steps uh, by uh, Yaha. So there is correction of telerics, there is correction uh, of uh, ghosts, there is matching Fourier. This is correction of where some interference pattern and whatever. So we understand really well our detectors. So then, rather than just fitting some complex model that you don't know what, the, what they are doing, uh, you can really go locally and correct for all of these effects, uh, like independently. And then you really have a huge gain 
in, uh, in Velocity India. So this is the first discussion uh, that I would like to have. Then I will have a second section that is more on stellar activity. Uh, but I would like to discuss with you, I don't know, in your instrument, what are the different effects that you are aware of in terms of uh, the systematics of the detector? Uh, how do you deal with those effects? And then uh, did some people implemented already some correction at the level of the extraction? Because you can also do some things at the level of the extraction. But sometimes, like for ghosts, it's super complicated because you have a flux that is diagonal towards the flux that you extract. This flux is not just a white light, it's a spectrum, so it will shift. So there is all those things. So I would like to have a discussion on this. <laughs> you can't see me smiling. <laughs> not putting up the hand. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'll just, just to start the discussion going really, um, so, essentially, you would have to design this sequence of corrections, even though you might know what, what ingredients to put in it, so you would design it in a purpose-built way for each instrument, right? Because you're using the data to inform and also you need to know about your instrument. And so I guess one of the things that I spend time thinking about and wondering about is how we optimize the, the sort of loop between uh, these different stages of the processing and the analysis so that people can use the data from the instruments while they might still be imperfect, but then use that to improve the processing and et cetera, et cetera. And particularly if we're trying to move towards a sort of more open um, community, as I think we are, uh, you know, we have to kind of figure out how to handle that. <laughs> All right, let's have uh, No, I have to, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so I, I, as you can imagine, a million things to say, but I guess you, you opened by making an incredible <laughs> argument that we should be doing RV in the 2D images and and you still come back to the idea that we should extract correctly but there's another way to think about it which is which is and maybe i don't know what yarara does exactly but but in principle we could be just pushing everything into the 2d imaging and we could really deal with that noise model and the biases of the imaging directly rather than kind of dealing with them indirectly through this extraction stage yes indeed but then, like modeling everything at the level of the 2D image is really tough, right? It is, and because I think it relates to Suzanne's comment because somehow that would only be possible if we had some kind of open set of tools where we could do the 2D modeling and we, and because otherwise only somebody who built the instrument could ever measure an RV or, or work on the spectrum. So we, we it, it is somehow, the idea of moving into 2D is somehow, in my mind, related also to the question of open science. So I don't know, but for example, for all the data from uh, Harps, Harps Nose, there is like does uh, at least nearly 20 years of Harps of data, all the raw frames are available, for example. So it's possible at this level to see what we can do and so on. Uh, but it's true that like doing the step of extracting the signal simplifies a lot the problem with optimal extraction that deals for a lot of things. But it's true, uh, how do you call it? Like it's a uh, uh, spectral perfectionism or whatever. It's, 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 yeah. it's how people call it, I think. Yeah, I actually... I actually have very strong opinions about all that, but I think it's it's sort of off topic. But I have a okay. <laughs> yeah, to your question about local systematics, I guess one question I have is how much better or worse would you do by simply throwing out every line that may be affected in any way by something local, right? So, so that's the most extreme option, right? You're just yeah, yeah. very selective, uh, which you could make you do worse or better. And I'm assuming that that's definitely not good enough. Um, while um, you, you want to do the corrections at the extraction level. Is there also a way to, if that fails, provide some kind of housekeeping data that allows people to 
still do enough? I mean, is there something you could provide, you know, a parameter that represents the ghost somehow that people can put in their GP later um, to, to correct for it, even if they can't fully do it at the spectral level? Yeah, indeed. So at, at the level of, for example, Yaha, how it's, how it's able to correct, we indeed extract a map of the ghosts that we can do with flats or whatever. And then basically we know the location of the ghosts, we know where they cross the stitching, and then this is used to really correct very locally on the spectrum, uh, on the extracted uh, spectrum, very correctly to, to apply uh, like a model to be able to correct for this effect. Um, so indeed, those are things that can be provided, and I think in terms of calibration and everything, we have, we have all the information there. So this is possible. Then regarding your first point, which is like removing uh, all the parts that are affected, of course you can do it uh, for stars that are very bright and so on. Uh, but then you start to see that, uh, like what Michael presented before, like if you want to start to deal with activity and so on, you need to be at very high signal to noise. So then you will decrease your signal to noise. And then if you go to fainter stars, then you will lose too much information. So I think we don't have too much lux luxury in just selecting a very small region of the spectrum on which we measure the velocity and then throw so, so the rest. And I think we have enough understanding of what is happening at the instrument level uh, that we can recover this signal. Sam? Sam? There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, not thinking about a lot of those parts three as well. I mean, we haven't done it like you've been digging in the parts and all. So at the moment, we're just in the thought processes of what we might want to do because it's down to the pipeline. But then thinking of going forward, that how you were just talking about um, how you might change the extraction in the first place. I think the instrument that we were talking earlier about laser frequency combs and instrument profile changes, which you would hope to be able to see um, with laser picture code changes and changes in the PSF. And we're sort of trying to think about how you might use that information um, to extract the spectrum differently in the future so that you, um, because, of, because the amazing intrinsic, um, very narrow alignment for laser frequency code, you can sort of track a lot of changes in the optical path. Um, due to all the other environmental things that are going on. So you could imagine that if you, you know, have a PSF interview, you, you could extract the spectrum differently. Um, and then, of course, a bit like some already being done with Hops and Hops North, but we, um, in Cambridge as well, we're looking at you know, the detailed pixel mapping. So that's what we're in the pipeline as well. This part, this part. But yeah, the ghost is an interesting one, and we don't, that's going to be different, but we don't know how, what level or idea you don't want any. But <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot, I mean, there's lots of different things there, but it's, it's interesting as well what you're saying about taking it from what you could do at the extraction level from your world spectrum or somehow cataloging all these changes in an interesting sort of, say, like the engineering database or calibration database so that you could use that information in a different way for the. So I, I don't know, perhaps some people from the express team, uh, Lily or <laughs> <laughs> what about how? Because you are you are also measuring like PSF vagations. Uh, when the instrument is really stable, do you really see significant changes? In terms of PSF uh, with the LFC? Or? We actually don't see that much PSF variation in Express, but it's because our camera barrel lenses are specifically designed to keep it stable. And so while it changes from like the far left and the far right of the CCD, the, 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 the variations within a pixel range are very small because it changes very gradually and smoothly. But that was like a very intentional design of the optical pad. Yeah. Okay. But in terms of, not in terms of the absolute PSF how it's behaved from uh, one side to the other of the detector, but uh, with time. Yeah, so how much, how the PSF varies with time? Like if you look at a specific part of the detector, how does it change with time? Because the idea of uh, having an instrument that is super stabilized, pressure control, is not to have any PSF change. So are you able to see some variation on? I don't think that we 
do, except for some discrete steps, because occasionally, say, the temperature in Arizona will we'll swing wildly. We'll have to refocus the instrument with our, with our focus motor, and so there we'll get like a different, like an offset, but otherwise it will very smoothly. Uh, I think Nato, you had um, So you, you are showing that with different um, steps in the processing, you can reduce the RMS. And uh, I'm wondering if you have an idea of what more could be gained. You know, like uh, if there are things we know about that are still not corrected, or if everything that is unexplored, everything else is unexplored territory and we really don't know what's happening beyond. So I so there, there are two yeah. questions really. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, do you think we did we correct for all the systematics that we know? Yeah. And is there some more and space what, basically? What more do you think you could be gained? So for sure like we want to correct for the systematic that are the strongest. Uh, so we, we, we looked at those uh, like spectral time series of residuals and we look where there was a lot of flux variation and then we went, okay, what is the problem here? Ah, it's a ghost. Okay, we correct for it. It's a stitching water. So the, most of the effect have been like the strong effect have been corrected for. Then, of course, there is some effect that the, the signal to noise of a spectral time series we are not able to resolve. But of course, those are smaller in amplitudes. And I would say that you know, probably we have done most of the job. Uh, and then uh, we can perhaps still gain uh, a few percent. But, but, uh, we, but the problem is also in the way we correct for it, because basically it's an iterative process. We correct for one thing, then we correct for the other, and so on. So, and some corrections have some cross-talk between them. And this is where there is a little bit some problem, and perhaps we can improve on that side. Because some corrections are very locally, because we know there is a ghost, so we correct only those pixels, but some corrections are on the entire spectrum, and there I think we can improve our, our model, our modelization. Okay, so you think that the priority is to get the existing corrections uh, to work? Uh, um, to have a better model, a like a joint better model. Joint model. That can then um, other effects that we know about, but that we still don't know how to correct. So at least from what we have seen on Harps, Harps, Nose, uh, Expresso, because those are the instruments that uh, we are dealing with, then I don't know on other instruments. Uh, I know, for example, if you start to go to near infrared instrument, you have plenty of other systematics uh, in terms of the detector, because they are really not as good as CCDs. You have remnants, you have, and those are other issues that could also be corrected for, I think. Uh, but at least for the instrument in the visible that, uh, uh, that we have been playing with, uh, we have investigated most of the systematics to correct. And perhaps we can, we can improve on the model, on the modelization of those. Okay. Uh, Lily? Uh, ah, no, Susan, sorry. Well, you answered my question already. Okay. <laughs> so Lily and uh, that is. Yeah, I really like the questions that you put up there because I feel like when I work on pipeline development, I think about it similarly, but like slightly differently. Like for your first question, I like to first think of like, what are the things that you really can't engineer out? And once you have a complete list of the things that have to be corrected afterwards, for example, the ghosting or the pixel position stitching errors, you really just like no matter how good you do, you'll have those in your, they'll have those in your data. And then the next question addresses like, well, what sort of calibration data do you have to collect to be able to diagnose and like, create models for these things, right? So maybe it's more laser of laser frequency comb that can scan across the pixels and you can understand the pixel position errors there. Or like you mentioned with the express, they're taking more like full frame where the entire detector is illuminated images to understand ghosting or other things like that. And so like I like I like the statement like if we could maybe in the summary or we could talk offline about what sort of things do you have to address to the extraction and not to the engineering. What how does that change the sort of calibration images you should be taking nightly or monthly or yearly? And then using that, we can implement. We can figure out what sort of models you need to use, informed by the calibration images you've collected. Yeah, I think this is yeah. Yeah, to to have like a set of things that we should do at the instrument level when you design it, but also in terms of calibration, uh, because there is a lot of things we can we can yeah we can extract from from those. And, and 
and, and it's interesting to compare different instruments. For example, like we so Express has an extended flat field fiber, and so we have a, a science fiber that's slightly larger than the one that most of the star images go down. And the idea behind that was that we would get higher signal on the edges of the orders that would be more informative. And so that's something we like put a lot of effort into engineering, and there's more moving parts in the spectrograph to inject that light versus the science one. And then it turns out to be something we just don't use very often. And so there's some things where like you think you need the data, but then when you have it, it's really not as useful as you think it would be. Uh, Baptiste, um, so <clears throat> we have a Slack question from Eric. Uh, um, <laughs> is the only one on Slack. <laughs> I think, do you have a good estimate uh, for the flux uncertainties at each uh, point of the detector due to the different effects you were mentioning? And if so, then it would be tempting to try propagating those uncertainties to get improved weights for each time. Yeah. And he was also asking if someone tried that and found that merely down weighting the lines affected by the non instrumental issue. Yeah. Perhaps, Michael, I don't know, do you, what was the level in terms of like percent of the flux that we were able to detect at the time for the effect? Spectral time survey level, it was like percent or it was. For the effect, you mean? Yeah, for the effect. It depends on the signal to noise ratio of the star that you observed and uh, the number no, no. of observation. Okay. So uh, it was uh, the per mile, actually. 0.1%. Ah, 0.1%. Okay. But I suppose this, if you add 500 of signal to noise. Yeah, high signal to noise ratio. But basically, yes, the signal to noise that would give you at which uh, simply. And then the other technique in terms of propagating the errors, I think we are not doing it at the moment. And indeed, this would be something that, that could improve. Uh, because we correct for a model, but since we don't propagate the errors, because most of the correction are done with PCA, uh, then it could a little bit perhaps improve it. Yeah. Uh, perhaps a final question, and then I want to move a little bit on stellar activity, or we can take one or two more, no problem. Yeah, maybe this would be a... Oh, yeah, actually, I, what I really... I talked to you a little bit about this, um, and I think a little bit about stuff on the near infrared, since that's what I care about. And there, the caloric stuff is much, much more of a problem. Yeah. So I'm just more interested in your thoughts and ideas on um, and opinions, really, about caloric correction or how you model it or the pros and cons of masking that out, the kind of information content you lose versus removing it out and potentially adding in, you know, uncertainties that we just don't quite understand, correlated noise that we won't be able to yeah. fully um, measure. So I'm not a specialist about near infrared and I never work with near infrared data, um, but at least how we are approaching the correction in our case, we really have a lot of spectra that are really spending a huge uh, barycentric radio velocity. And then if we are able to get a few of those spectra that are not affected by Telerix and then analyzing the time theory, we are able to decorrelate it for the effect of telluric lines. Then uh, the problem I think with this is that even this in the near infrared will not work because there will never be a moment where your line will not be affected. And so basically I think you cannot use data driven techniques for that. You have to, do, to, to rely on models, uh, but then we know what is like, our understanding of the physics is uh, is limited, so the models are not are not correct. So yeah, very tough in the near infrared. <laughs> and then of course, if you mask them completely, you use ten percent of the radio velocity content that you should have. I should say I can't stop myself. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. The whole reason we built Wable was to get the telluric signal out in a data-driven way, even if the telurics are everywhere. Yeah, that was the original because okay. it's a because there's a causal thing. The star is doing one thing and the atmosphere is doing another. So if you have enough epochs, they separate the data. But you even don't even if they're dense lines. So even if you have an M star Which and dense to work. It gets tricky, doesn't it? It's true that when you get deep clerics, yeah. then you have these problems that the convolution and the multiplication don't tend don't. But I think, but we know how that works, so I still think we would be able to build a mechanistic model of that even. But that was the original idea of the wobbly model. Well, so I, I, I'm sorry. 
No, I was going to say, if you were able to do that effectively in the near infrared, then talk to the exoplanet atmospheres people. Yeah. Yeah. I've just, I've thought about this a lot, especially when the Wobbly paper came out, so our department lit on fire because we were like, great, this will solve the caloric. But then we thought about the order, the like end observations that you need, and it's just so expensive, it feels like. I mean, a minimum of what I was, the very few tests that we ran, um, like dozens of spectra mm -hmm. and very high signal toys to really pull out that extraction, right? But that's, mm -hmm. even on the brightest targets, is hours and hours of time that is really tough to get. And then when you do that over dozens of targets, I'm not saying it's, I, I would love that. I would love unlimited spectrum. <laughs> I would love unlimited time in all the spectrum in the world, right? To do to do that forest of calorics and even from there extract the RVs. So soon we'll have solar RVs in the near infrared. Mm -hmm. This can help. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Megan and uh, Sorry, not to not to drag this on too long. I did just want to make the point that in principle, your telurics are shared between all stars, so they're just with the same instrument. So you can relax that assumption that you make any efforts of an individual star if you have the computational power to um, fit all of your stars simultaneously. Shared instrumental um, And I think that's a general uh, principle that can be applied to the lab. of the things we're discussing here. Just looking at multiple stars at the same time and finding shared effects can be really powerful. Yeah. Testify. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but and I, 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 was, I was just going to add to that, that one could make the argument that we're trying to solve this problem in order to find small planets on long periods for which we will need a lot of data anyway. So you'll get, it, it's expensive, but what we're trying to detect is already expensive, regardless of the telluric. Testify more. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thanks a lot for this uh, first uh, discussion. So now I would like to discuss a little bit about um, stellar activity and the fact that when you use CCF template matching, you average the information from all uh, the spectral lines and you lose uh, the information on the physical content uh, that you have. So this is something that I tried for the first time, so <laughs> perhaps tell me if it works or not. <laughs> this is my vision of how stellar activity is affecting spectral lines. Um, so here you have a star, okay. Uh, here you have like the, the, the bottom of the photosphere where you start to see photons, it's where you have the continuum, and then you have your spectral line. So this is just inverse like this, okay. But basically a shallow spectral lines will be formed very deep inside the star. A strong spectral line, the core of it will be formed uh, close to the surface. Then you add convection to that. And we know uh, on the sun that the convection, and from models as well, that convection is, is stronger deep inside the photosphere than at the surface. What you have a boundary, so it makes sense. So then, uh, if you think about the spectral lines formed along all uh, the photosphere for strong spectral lines, like the, the part that is close to the continuum will be strongly blue shifted. Uh, because you have strong convection. When you are at the level of the core, you don't have a lot of convection, so basically zero velocity there. Okay. Um, so then, uh, this is just a measurement of the convective blue shift of uh, spectral lines. Uh, so this, each point is a spectral line core, and it's by how much uh, the, 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 you see what is the shift between the wavelengths of this line in the sun, and what you measure in the laboratory. And basically, you see that strong uh, shallow lines are completely blue shifted, while strong lines are not. So this is exactly this, where basically you take only the core of the lines, deep lines you have a strong uh, blue shift, shallow lines you don't have a strong blue shift. Okay. So this is what gives rise to the like C shape uh, of spectral lines. So here you have a bunch of spectral lines, so it's only the bisectors of the lines that are put together. You have like a hundred of uh, iron two lines, and of, uh, yeah, 104 in this case. And basically, although you have some small differences, whatever, most of the lines follow the same, uh, what, the, the same, the same shape. And basically, this is because you put different depths uh, into the stone. 
So then you can look at the line core, but then if you measure the velocity on the line, okay, this line, because it's only a very strong blue chip, you measure a strong velocity for this line. If you measure this one, you, you will average out over all the different velocities, so you arrive at the end to a velocity that is small. Um, so this is what happens when you don't have any activity, just convective blue shift, and then you put a spot. So a spot is created by strong magnetic fields that tends to inhibit the convection. So when you start to have a spot, you will inhibit your convection. You will have less convection on your star. So basically, smaller shifts there. And so without activity, you have a strong convective blue shift. Uh, with activity, it's reduced. So then uh, if you measure what the velocity on the lines, all the line profile, then you will also see a strong reduction uh, for the shallow lines, because you go from something big to something small. For the strong lines, you don't see so much difference because they are not so much affected by convective blue shift uh, at the first uh, place. And so with activity, basically, this relation becomes something that is more flat somehow. And so here, uh, what you can see is, so if you have a varying activity, so you have a spot that passes by and then uh, goes away, basically what you will see is your spectral lines that are doing like this, basically the velocity of each individual. And this is what we were able to show with Michael uh, in the paper in 2020, where basically we measured what is the amplitude of variation of the spectral lines due to activity uh, with regard uh, to their line depths. And basically, we see the fact that shallow spectral lines really are strongly changing in velocity, while the deep spectral line in yellow here are not changing so much. And this, if you measure just the velocity on those different sets of lines, this is really what you see. So you really see uh, strong differences in velocities. And so the problem when you do a CCF is that you lose this information. Because at least how we do the CCF, so we have the stellar lines, okay, that we take into account, and then we put weights to optimize the velocity. So a strong line, because it has very uh, deep, uh, what very, uh, uh, sorry, uh, very steep uh, wings, uh, will have more radial velocity content because radial velocity content is directly proportional to the derivative. And then for shallow spectral lines, you put a smaller weight. And then, so if you use those weights, you work to something more or less like this. Okay, it's not very precise, I'm sorry. But basically, in your CCF, like, you will lose this original bisector that is affecting all the lines the same way. And you will, you will most, of, most of the time, you arrive to, to a bisector that is rather straight. And basically, you lose this information. So, like, we are investigating uh, different things. Uh, first thing is that here, what we did is we took a spectrum, and this is a work uh, led by Khaled, who will uh, speak uh, uh, on, on, Tuesday, on Thursday. Basically, we measured what is the average temperature uh, of the formation of a point in the spectrum. And so we see that the core spectral lines are formed at temperature that are like lower than a uh, region closer to the continuum. And then the idea is to measure the velocity only on the like low temperature and only on the high temperature to be able to probe how, this, how different parts of the bisector are moving uh, with activity. Um, okay, so this is a way we can learn a little bit more about the, the physics, what the news, the physical information that we have that is affecting radial velocity. And another thing, this is also uh, Inan, a postdoc in my group that uh, will speak uh, to know about this code SOAP GPU. Uh, so I don't know if some people know about SOAP, but it's basically a, a simulation to model activity, where you put different CCF on the star, then you, you shift them uh, due to the rotation, and so on. Uh, and then basically now what it, what it did is that rather than using CCF, is using uh, spectral. So on the star, you can see spectra of uh, the quad photosphere, of the spots, of the facula. And then it integrate everything with GPU, uh, which really accelerates a lot. And here, for example, it's a, it's a simulation of the sun with real spot, uh, like um, spot um, 
like number of spots on, on the on the sun that rotates and everything. And here, this he generated this in, in a few minutes, and uh, we have uh, like 3,000 uh, spectra. So all the spectra are generated behind, and then those could be used also to to use techniques uh, to mitigate stellar activity uh, in the background. So Hada, yes. Um, is it an actual spectrum of a faculae, or do you use a spot and then approximate things? So we don't have a magical spectrum uh, of a facula. It was never taken. But in fact, now, before in original SOAP, we had a solar observation, either the quad photosphere or uh, a spot. And in fact, now you can use those, or you can use also phoenix spectra. And you change the bisector uh, following some paper by uh, Loner Butcher that really measured uh, how the convection changes as a function of uh, uh, limb to center angle, uh, and you are also able to use synthetic uh, spectrum as you want. But it's not, yeah, you don't have the magnetic field yet, so it's not perfect. But yeah, uh, okay. And what well, this is the the end. Uh, so basically, so this is a little bit my understanding on what we could do on, like, with our understanding of the physics to get better like proxy, better radio velocity uh, affected by activity. But I'm sure you have also plenty of other ideas. So I would like to discuss this uh, if you are open to it. <laughs> yes? In the new version of the salt, do you have um, like evolution of the active regions over time? So in fact, so there is several versions of this uh, new SOAP GPU, so which will be a code that you will, uh, but we are publishing it, we'll be publishing very soon. So either you can do like before, like put one or two uh, spec, uh, one or two spot, and then model what is the effect. Uh, or there is, you can also have, it's based on uh, the distribution of spots, facula on the sun with the rotation, you can, it can generate a model of stellar activity, more or less, and then model those. But there is also a version of the code where you just give the SDO images, it extracts the spots, the facula, and then model what is the effect on those. So there is, there is the, so those, those three different things. Very simple to much more complex. <laughs> uh, I just want to make a, a comment on the simulations. Uh, it's uh, so when you did the RV fitting challenge, uh, I, th I think it was with uh, sub simulations. Yes. And um, I think in that case, the activity was uh, very well represented by a linear combination of a few activity indicators. Yes. And it doesn't seem to be the case in uh, real data. So, I mean, th there is probably something that can be improved in the simulation so that, uh, that to, to reproduce the fact that you can have maybe higher phase shifts between the indicators. But at least I think in the way that the simulations are done now, they are too simplistic. Okay, yeah. So, yes. And, and I don't, if you do the RV analysis, the RV fitting challenge analysis with just a periodogram and a linear fit with a B sector or a WHM logarithm prime HK, you find almost all the planets. So I would say that in the, when I did the challenge like a few years ago, in terms of high model activity, there was, I, well, I did some things that was a little bit simple. Yeah, I think now we are a little bit more complex in that, okay. and it would be interesting to see really what uh, we are able to do now. If just uh, simply lean, linearly decorrelating with different activity proxies uh, works like super well, and indeed there would be a problem in the model, uh, we, we have to check that. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to make a philosophical comment, which is that the you know when we take the 2D, we take these beautiful 2D spectral images and we compress them down to a CCF or an RV measurement or whatever. And as you emphasized really nicely, that's a huge loss. 
And it's also the case kind of that God takes this beautiful star where there's all, there's a spectrum and there's all sorts of features on the surface and there's different things happening in different depths and compresses it all down to one spectrum, which is coming in at the top of the atmosphere. <laughs> and and I, I feel like there's somehow, I feel like there's some connection between these two things. We're, we're seeing this linear, in both cases, we're kind of working with this linear superposition of things and we have very strong physical priors. You, you presented some very nice physical intuitions there. I think most of the things we're doing are not really capturing all of those physical intuitions. I think we, yeah, well, but most of the papers that I've read to learn about these things are papers from the 70s and uh -huh, 80s. Yes, exactly, yeah. Before exoplanet was existing, because people were doing solar physics and whatever, and then exoplanet, oh, it's simple, let's go to exoplanet. <laughs> uh, but no, in fact, there is really a lot of stuff, and we, I think, as a radio velocity community that really want to push the radio velocity further in precision, we also have to get into contact with solar physicists, with uh, stellar physicists to understand the models and everything, because there is a lot to learn there, really. Yes, Jean. I, I wanted to discuss a bit more, maybe have some comments on the part of the simulations and the, whether or not solar data can help us and what Nathan said. Uh, I, I wonder if, if it would be feasible since, since we kind of want to be a data-driven community to some extent. Uh, <laughs> maybe we don't. <laughs> but uh, uh, at least we want to be observation-driven at, at some point and to learn from the observation. I, I wonder if it would be feasible to, to build a community-wide framework where we can have um, where we can build simulations that would actually help us in the sense of um, maybe, maybe we can argue if whether or not the simulations that were built for the radio velocity fitting challenge, whether or not they were realistic, but I guess they were realistic to what we knew back then and, and that, that's fine. So, but I, I wonder if it would be useful to have um, a framework really, a, like a computational framework, a, a place that we could all use as a community in order to build these simulations uh, so that we could somehow build um, test data for machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. We could somehow build uh, data that is not just the solar data, but doesn't have planets, but is realistic. Uh, and so I, I wonder if it would be useful to to coordinate and to collaborate on, on such a framework to build this simulation. So, you want to answer to that? Can I? What? <laughs> can I? Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, so, as, as I understand what you're asking is that you want to be a data-driven communi community by having physics-driven Simulations, right? <laughs> that, is, that is in the end, that's it. If we have the physics driven and the data driven combined, that's what's going to solve this thing, surely. Um, so I agree that we should have these simulations, but you can only actually have them if they're physics driven, if we actually understand how to make these simulations. And then we can throw all our data driven things towards the good simulations, because the sun is only going to get us the sun <laughs> and solar type stars but so i fully agree you need simulations but in order to do that we need to combine the physics driven people with the data driven people together presumably now you can answer <laughs> um well no it's um just that yeah there's 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 got to be some back and forth it's not going to be a unidirectional um thing i just wanted to bring up uh, because it hasn't come up yet, and uh, I guess that group's not represented here today, that there's been a, a whole bunch of simulations coming out of the Grenoble group as well, Medellin yeah. and EM collaborators, yeah. and they have, I mean, arguably they've made some ad hoc assumptions, but they have attempted to simulate data for other types of stars than the sun for, for F stars and K stars. Yeah. Uh, it's a time series rather than CCFs or spectra, but that might be worth bearing in mind that these data sets are available, and also their framework is sufficiently simple that you can actually reproduce it. it 
I did it two weeks ago and it took me mm -hmm. two days. No, no. Um, so, so I think also a question is to which level we want to complexify the problem. Uh, because like people have been trying to model the sun, Heather is a little bit doing these kind of things where you use MHD simulation that are very uh, like computationally expensive and then model very locally on the sun what is the effect on one spectral line. So I don't know, Heather, perhaps you have an idea about that. Would it be possible to use MHD simulation to simulate an entire star for the full spectrum? Because one line, we cannot do it on one line because we don't have the signal to noise that. Um, I don't know if you could do a whole star, but I think you can do a whole spectrum for a, a patch of a, of a star. And that depends on the resolution. So they're like Sophia Sellis and Dana Stravins have been uh, doing a bit of work in this area as well. And I have seen that some stuff come out where, where you can do, if you sacrifice resolution and, and temporal sampling, you can do a lot of lines. And so it's something I'm, I'm looking into. So we might still need some simplified um, scenarios, but I think you can get more lines. And I I don't think it's the worst thing ever to, to, to do just small patches and be able to like incline those patches, but you do then miss out on like global circulation type things like meridional circulation or supergranulation. So you might still have to figure out a way into that. The, there's Matthias Rempel has done some stuff about the MHD simulation of a spot. I think that is the only person who's done an MHD simulation of a spot. And there's been no line synthesis done on it that I know. I could be wrong. Maybe it's happened in the very recently. But um, you need quite a large box to get the spot. And then it's, the, the, it's, it's quite computationally intensive there. But maybe, again, you could do a large box to get a bit of supergranulation and start understanding it from from there and and i don't know maybe you can move everything into to gpu right? that saves you a bit thanks but, but it's very interesting because we often see ourselves as observers building instruments and running surveys but there's a this is showing the collision of the worlds it's actually enormously in our interest if Fundamental stellar physics research is being well funded in, in yeah. Europe and America. And, yeah. and I think we should and strongly the world. support that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, here we're very heavily in Europe and North, in North America. But, but, okay. um, but uh, uh, it's, it's interesting when, when we think about like decadal priorities or whatever, we actually really need better theory right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that, that's, I mean, Jen and I will talk a little bit about the, the NASA NSF EPR working group that was run, but that was one of the biggest things that we said, is that you really need to invest in, in the, the research and analysis side of things. Part of it is these data-driven techniques that we're talking about, but a lot of it is just fundamental physics, understanding that, that knowledge. And computational power was estimated to be a significant like cost in that. And I, I suspect that Things, my my intuition is things like, like the previous version of, of SOAP anyways, where it fit well this linear combination of, of activity indicators is because the component that is capturing best is that photometric effect that like the analysis is seeing that's showing up in the end indicators and, and you can see that there. Whereas if you're actually getting to the faculae side, I think that's less represented accurately in the simulations. That's our the probably the biggest stumbling block that we all agree in terms of RV, and it's the worst represented in the simulations side at the moment. Belinda. Yeah, so just blowing on from that. Um, uh, <laughs> within uh, the Hot Street Tower Hunting uh, collaboration, um, there's been a, a small group of us tasked with answering the question of if spectral polarimetry can be useful for uh, assisting with uh, activity on the, the sort of the terra hunting experiment type of stars, so these sort of quiescent, uh, slow rotating stars. Um, and so, one of the there are a couple of avenues that we're, we're currently exploring for trying to answer this question. Um, and one of them is is going down the MHD simulation route, and how can we simulate a spectrum? Of, to, of, of a solar type star with a, with a small magnetic signal that we'd possibly be able to detect. Um, and I know that 
uh, Nikolai Pishkunov has been uh, working to get MHD simulations from a colleague of his, and I think they're called Pencil. Um, and they're, uh, yeah, 3D MHD simulation. And they are, they, they do one version that is for uh, the normal photosphere, and they do one that has an active region in it as well. So that might be interesting to Yes, but I assume that when they do an active region, it's not actually a spot. Oh, okay. um, it's it's just a higher magnetic field region, which is actually more akin to like a, a like a facular plage region. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That's probably what it. That's my. I mean, I'm less familiar with pencil, more with like neuron and seg and cobalt and stuff. But most of the the magnetic field, and you can get pores, so spots without the like, like you don't have the difference between the penumbra and number. It's just like you don't have that extra annulus. Um, it's like a small baby spot kind of thing. So you can get pores naturally appearing in these small boxes, but to actually get a spot is quite difficult. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyone, there's only like three of us working on this at the moment. It's myself, Batista, and Nikolai. And the more that we think about this problem, the more we realize the work that we have to do. So um, if, there's, if there's people interested in this, please come and talk to me because uh, we definitely would love more ideas and, and, and more minds on this problem. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, Baptiste, uh, I think we are soon uh, close to the hour, so I think we should wrap up, but uh, still one or two questions, comments, and then uh, we will end for the day because I think that everyone is starting to be a little bit tired. <laughs> it's very quick and easy question. I, I was just wondering in terms of pure stellar physics approach, can you, since the spectrum of a spot is quite different from the spectrum of the quiet photosphere, can you constrain actually the spot properties like <coughs> even magnetic field or stuff like this by choosing which line you want to use, like which temperature you want to use? That's, I was wondering, is Khaled uh, at work in that direction? Or yeah, I mean, I, there's probably others that can answer this, but uh, I mean, you, there, there's been some work into like looking at temperature sensitive lines and being able to pull out the temperature of the spot and stuff. Um, so that that is being done, I think. <laughs> Yes. Um, this is a bit of a general question, but besides the LSD techniques, does anyone know of any other groups that are focusing on trying to get the magnetic field, like unsigned, like absolute magnetic field is possible from stars using different techniques? Or is it kind of the LSD the main? So I didn't get the question. Can we get magnetic field for other stars? Or? Yeah, so is it... Do you know of any specific ways that are being uh, investigated to get the unsigned magnetic flux um, to precisions that we can use and use it as a proxy for stellar activity to understand better? And I know you, um, Florian mentioned the LSD technique, but is there any other techniques that anyone knows that it's been talked about or developed in the... Um, there's a paper by Kochukov, 2020, and he looks at Zeeman intensification. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's also for intensity spectra, so that's one thing. And in fact, there is uh, Steve Saw at the CFA that is a lot working on that. And basically, the thing is that it's not like Zeeman broadening, where your lines become broader, it's basically the depth of the lines that change. But this is also linked to it's not the lambda factor, it's another, another factor that you can measure for spectral lines, but spectral line will be sensitive differently. Um, so this, this could be a way to measure inside magnetic flux as well for other stuff. Okay, good. So thanks a lot for the discussion. Yeah, I'd like to thank um, everybody for today. Oh, sorry, also. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah. So thanks to that and Suzanne, yeah. <laughs> no, I wanted to thank everybody who, who gave talks and participated in the discussions today. It's been great. Um,